Good evening, everybody. I'm Bishop Randy Dean, and I'm here Facebook Live. We're, we're going to make a run at this again. I'm here at the Forest Hills Retreat Center here in the beautiful metropolis of Forest, Wisconsin. This is a project near and dear to my heart, uh, a place of recovery. Uh, I'm the spiritual care director here. Uh, Jean Morfitt is the executive director and, and uh, papa of this house. And it, it, this is a great story. And I'll put a link in the comments later so you can learn more about Forest Hills Retreat Center as it is a, a part of spiritual program retreat. So I'm here today uh, attempting a Facebook Live from here because the signal is better out here. So uh, we, you go where the signal's good, right? I'm so happy to uh, share with you during this season of Advent. Advent, for me, has long been my, my favorite uh, uh, piece, the chunk of the calendar and the Christian calendar that is leading us to something. It's leading us to a beauty and to a, a joy that, that we need to anticipate and we need to hold dear to ourselves. So I want to talk about Advent week number two. This is Sunday number two of Advent. Oh, I love Advent. I love Advent. It's it's good for my soul and, and has been for many, many years. As we do uh, every Sunday night sanctuary, I want you to be prepared to have communion at the close, have a cracker or some bread, a wafer ready for communion at the end, have some juice or wine, whatever your drink of choice is for communion at the conclusion. We'll receive together uh, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That'll happen at the conclusion. We always start with the Lord's Prayer. And I, I want to pause very briefly here with the Lord's Prayer and challenge you as we face this worldwide pandemic. COVID-19 just keeps ravaging, especially the United States of America. We're, we're all pressed. How do I pray? How do I manage this, this call to prayer in an effective and, and, and proactive and a grounded way? I would suggest to you praying the Lord's Prayer is the best way to, to take on this calamity of epic proportions. We are told that uh, an epidemic pandemic of this nature comes along about once every 100 years. So what that says to me is that there's history involved, and if there's history involved, then we ought to approach it with a historic faith, historic uh, prayer. And I'm telling you the Lord's Prayer is historic. We're joining the democracy of the dead, the, the cloud of witnesses who are over us have prayed the Lord's Prayer long before us, you know. This is one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing with Sunday Night Sanctuary. I want people to understand we 21st century Christian, Christians did not invent Christianity. This has been going on a long time, and it's important for us to learn from history, from our, our brothers and sisters who've gone before us through hundreds of years of challenges and, and epidemics and pandemics, and they've learned some things that we need to learn today, I think. We could learn historically how to be people of a rooted faith that joins with powerful, enormously influential mothers and fathers in the faith for two millennia who've prayed the Lord's Prayer. I'd like to imagine that they're in some form or another, as I pray that prayer, they are in some form or another saying, Amen. See there, there's another one. See there, there's another one. Another, there's somebody else now in the 21st century who is praying this highly valued, deeply powerful prayer. So let's, let's go at that. Would you, would you join me with hands before you to receive heaven's bounty? I pray with my eyes open because I enjoy taking in the scenery that is coming my way, uh, whether it be visual or by faith. I pray with my eyes open like a child expecting something wonderful. Here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
and we receive God's answer for this pandemic into our hands, God's answer for the calamities on earth, we press those valued heaven-sent beauties to our hearts. We receive heaven's best for earth's poverty, for earth's cry for help. And God, we ask that all that value, all that truth, all that power of the Lord's Prayer would go out to everyone affected, frontline medical workers, doctors, nurses, everyone in hospitals and clinics all around the world and in our nation who are suffering greatly trying to fight this thing off. And, uh, and God, reach out, reach out, almighty God, with on earth as it is in heaven to the suffering families and the suffering uh, th those suffering at home or in hospitals with COVID-19. This is a real deal, folks. This is not this is not play. This is not rehearsal for anything else. This is real. And uh, I suggest to you that every one of us, while we pray, we should mask up when we're in public. We should wash our hands. We should don't touch your face. Let's be people of responsible, loving our neighbors. Uh, I've, I've been saying, I wear a mask as my sign of support for doctors and nurses on the front line, I wear a mask in support of all the families suffering. You know, we've got a local fire chief here in western Wisconsin who is who has uh, uh, just fighting for his life. And I'm convinced that we need to be in support of people just like that. If you wear a pink ribbon, as you should, in support of breast cancer then I and those suffering with it, I think you ought to wear a mask in support of those who are fighting for their life in the middle of this pandemic. So... Here we go. I want to jump right into uh, my my comments here today. I'm trying to find where they went. I had them right here. There they are. Sorry. Uh, I'm I'm utterly convinced that one of the things that could happen in evangelical Christianity in the 21st century is that we would learn to to exercise the holy pause. Evangelicalism has gotten in, into a great big hurry a great big hurry for answers to prayer, a great big hurry for God to do something. And I'm convinced one of the things we're missing in that great big hurry is that God has done something and he is longing for our, our contemplation of it, our participation in it, our embrace of it. Uh, in my in my history as a as a pastor, I was taught that the church calendar is just cold and dead, and I've come to believe that that's sadly wrong. The church calendar can lead you line by line by beautiful line to understand the the glories and the goodnesses of the gospel and of the kingdom of God that's been there waiting for us to just embrace along with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people gone before us who have followed and in the, the, the calendar of events and the scriptures and the stories that teach us valued, rooted foundations that help us reach for the skies. So Advent for me, if you know me at all, for, so, you know, somebody that would suggest that Randy Dean has changed, they don't know Randy Dean because Randy Dean has celebrated Advent for a very long time. I, I embrace the beauty of the lead up to Christmas. This isn't the Christmas season. No, not yet. This is Advent. Pause, wait, embrace, think, meditate, take in the beauties and the goodness that is being offered. Uh, when Christmas comes, there will be on the first day of Christmas, there will be 12 days of Christmas to follow. That's the Christmas season. You know, we've been cheating ourselves, really. I, years ago, I went to the Ukraine, and I got there on the last day of Christmas, on January 6th, I think it is. And they were celebrating Christmas on that day. They had an all-day church service, and it was phenomenal. It was a blowout, all the stops, sing, dance, shout, have a good old time, and I loved it. I wondered then, how can we bring this home to Western Christianity? Well, I'm just a guy out here attempting to do my part. Advent. Let's talk about the the lead up to Advent. As you can see from the title here, um, I, I, Mae West is uh, the saint. Mae West is the quote that I borrow this from. No less than May said... Too much of a good thing is wonderful. Too much of a good thing. Well, how, how is it that that relates to Advent? 
It relates in that it commands and calls our attention to a good thing coming. Jesus came in the first advent, in the first coming. Until we have plumbed the depth and the beauty of the first coming, let's just pause on any reach or overreach really into the second coming and be people of that first coming where significant profound kingdom truths have been demonstrated to us on this second week of advent we celebrate uh the the calling and the rise of uh, of john the baptist whose whose parents zacharias and elizabeth were uh, were, were given a promise of a child in their old age magnificent story go back and read it in the in the gospel of luke but i'm i'm gonna i'm sorry but i'm i'm reaching through all the stories of advent here so second week technically talks specifically about uh zacharias and elizabeth and their son john the baptist but i want to gather in some other truths from advent i'll i'll do that for the next two sundays as well here on facebook live i want to talk to you about the goodness that is really ours in the story that is ours. Let's let's embrace this grand story and not race past it without uh, fully plumbing the beauties of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a child of faith. Faith has always taught me that the gospel has got to be way better than just an escape from the threat of an angry God. The gospel has got to, I've always thought that, but for many years I hid it like, there must be something wrong with me. I must be a, a heretic. Well, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm a full-grown uh, father in the faith. And as a full-grown father in the faith at 67, I'm convinced there are goodnesses of the gospel we have yet to really believe. We are not here to celebrate a God who is just uh, offering an escape from hell so that we can get to heaven. There is a grander purpose in his beauty than that. I ran across something uh years ago from Christ Cathedral, Christ Church Cathedral in Vancouver, Canada. It, it expresses what I'm trying to say here much better. On their church sign, they said, if you've been told that God is some kind of punishing, capricious, angry bastard with a killer surveillance system who is basically always disappointed with you for being a human being, then you've been lied to. The church has failed you. We are sorry. I love that. That honesty cuts through all the crap. That honesty cuts through all the stuff, the BS that the church has offered up and called the gospel. Our God is not an angry, capricious, punishing bastard with a killer surveillance, always watching for something gone wrong. We are, we are offered a God in the face of Jesus. So we have to imagine now, not just imagine, but thoroughly believe in the, the God who looks like Jesus because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. So if we've seen Jesus, what did we see? We see this reckless love, this reckless forgiveness, this continual healing of the sick. No blaming anybody for being sick. No shaking a finger at people for having made mistakes. This is Jesus who when he sees a hole in the roof and he sees the, the, the lame man being lowered by his friends, he's forgiven the, the young man his sins before the young man even whispers a word. I, somebody said recently to me that, well, don't you believe in repentance? Yes, I believe you'll repent so much more after you find the love of God than you will to get the love of God. Quit thinking that somehow we have to get in God's good side, God's good favor before we receive anything from him. We're on his good side. This is his favor. This is the year of the Lord's favor. There is no bad side to God. There is no God waiting to get another pound of flesh. So on the first advent, we see Jesus, who according to uh, Hebrews 3, 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. Uh, the same Jesus. This is not a different Jesus that we're waiting to come in the second advent. That first advent showed us the Father. That Father is in the face of Jesus. And then in Revelation 1-4, we see that he is uh, who is and was and is to come. This is Jesus, who is, who was, and is to come. So when Jesus comes again, I know there are some people who believe that he's coming for his pound of flesh. It's, it's, uh, I, I wrote it this way. There are a few folks waiting for a new angry Jesus to come again and settle the score. 
There are others of us, however, who have come to know and believe that Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, and forever, this same Jesus, who is the friend of sinners, who is the healer of the broken, will return, and the same character that he demonstrated in the four Gospels that we cherish and we love and we tell our children about. This same Jesus will come not conquering in violence, but he will come conquering the world with forgiveness and love. See, I grew up in a church culture many years ago that taught that, you know, if the coming of Christ were to happen in the moment when I cussed, if I were to say angry bastard, like I just said right here on Facebook Live, and then suddenly Jesus came, well, then I might miss the rapture. Another story. I'll get to that maybe in a minute. I'd miss his return, his, re his rapture. That was the kind of paranoia that was taught to me as the gospel, that you'd better be good boys and good girls because if he comes and catches you in a sin, then you're doomed. I've got good news for you. The good news is the world has been forgiven by God through Christ. He's been We have been reconciled to God through Christ. And now we have the message. We are ambassadors of his reconciliation. Not ambassadors of his threat to come, but we are reconciled. We are ambassadors telling the world, hey, God, good news. God is in a good mood. He's not sending his son Jesus in a different mood than he was the first coming. In the Advent first, you saw a God who was forgiving, healing, restoring, recovering all, all, all. That is the same Jesus who will return. He's going to conquer the world with love and forgiveness and restoration and healing. How is that going to happen? Well, I don't know. I can't wait. Because the first advent was a magnificent explosion of goodness. The second advent, ooh, baby, that's going to be a second explosion of love and goodness. It's going to be a second explosion of how God can forgive and wash away the sins of the world as he did in the first coming. The advent teaches us that we're waiting for the grand light that is ours to be fully explored, fully shown to all the world. By the way, here's, a, here's another scripture that, that I, um, I've heard in my past taught that, well, this is how it's all going to come down. He'll return and every eye will see him. Now, again, I've always been a bit of a contrarian. And I wondered how, if every eye is going to see him when he returns, how are we in North America going to see the same Jesus that people of faith in Australia are going to see. They're down under. It just made no sense to me. But there again, I thought, something wrong with me. Now I understand every eye, every eye, every, every heart that is hungry for healing and love and restoration and forgiveness and recovery, every heart and eye hungry for the goodness of God will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And we will find him to be the same Jesus who came in the first advent. Second advent will look like the first. It'll, it'll fall in the middle of great darkness. And then suddenly in the great darkness, a light arises. And that light shines toward the coming of a king. A king who is nothing like kings of this earth. See, kings of this earth like to... Uh, rough up their enemies. Kings of this earth like some law and order in order to prove how big and bad and tough they are. But Jesus comes with a sword, not in his hand, but in his mouth. A sword that pierces to the heart, not for the purpose of punishment, but for the purpose of power and restoration and goodness and recovery. I believe Christianity is undergoing a wonderful revolution. I believe that many are right now, and I'm one of them, conducting an honest evaluation of how Jesus Christ is exactly who he was, who he is, and who he is to come. In his first coming, he healed the sick. He forgave blatant violators of the law. And in the last act of his life, Jesus welcomes a criminal into the kingdom. This same Jesus, the angels asked the disciples, uh, what are you looking at? They said, well, he went that way. And they, he, they said, this same Jesus will come again in like manner. This same Jesus will be exactly this when he returns a second time. 
He didn't ascend into heaven to get a bad attitude. He didn't go into heaven to go get ticked off. So what we are, uh, I think, in many ways facing in 21st Christianity, first 21st century Christianity, is I, I've called these folks, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're experiencing spiritual refugees who are fleeing the harsh, hard, uh, politically motivated uh, voices of evangelicalism. We are, we're reaching a point, and I think this is overdue, actually, where many people are saying, I I'm sorry, I, I don't see Jesus in, in a political platform. I don't see Jesus in the promise of a president. I don't see Jesus in the promise of better, of better legislation. Uh, I don't see Jesus in the, the Supreme Court ruling for or against anything. I see Jesus walking dusty paths among the poor and the needy, walking through uh, entire um, regions and healing the sick. I don't see Jesus needing uh, a Senate or a Congress in order to do his work. I mean, Jesus fell into the middle of the Roman Empire and largely ignored the Roman Empire, gave them scant notice. When he was asked about paying taxes, he said, show me the image on that coin. They said, well, that's Caesar's image. He said, well, then give Caesar what's his. It's just a coin. But whose image are we bearing? We bear the image of God. So we don't owe Caesar anything more than to pay our taxes, but we owe God our very souls, our very life. There are multitudes of spiritual refugees fleeing the brick and mortar of evangelical conservative Christianity because they've had it. They're, they're, they're done. They're done with the harsh, hard, capricious, punishing view of who God is. They're looking for a Jesus who looks like the one we read about in the Gospels. And they ought to be looking for that same Jesus. So my effort, my passion, my calling is to shove aside the political nonsense and reach for the kingdom principles and powers that are really always been ours to begin with. So I'm, I'm looking for us to be, uh, you know, my story, I said early that I was going to talk all over the, the Advent story. I love uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent. That for me, I celebrate uh, the, the Magi. Third Sunday, by the way, next Sunday, that's Mary. I, I'll talk a lot more about Mary next Sunday. But the Magi, let me, let me read to you something I, I wrote years ago about the Magi. They're the ultimate party crashers. They got no invitation except their deep contrarian spiritual instincts. These guys don't know, they wouldn't know Genesis from Thessalonians. They stepped into the stage of profound conservative fundamentalism, so bound up with Bible scripture proof text that the ultimate promise of the Bible sleeping in a food trough wasn't found by those conservative fundamentalists. But these astrological radiant men looked into the sky and said, look, there's a star. Let's follow the star, the simplicity of their childlike heart. So the Magi now of the 21st century, I think, are still searching for Jesus. In spite of all the Bible thumpers and Bible proof texting fundamentalists attempting to keep them out of our pews. So to all of you who feel like a spiritual homeless troop, wandering, wondering, but still loving Jesus, but uncomfortable with some of his fierce and angry defenders, waving swords and demanding political uh, postures from those who follow them, I want you to be of good cheer. The Magi, the kings of the East, the wise men of the Christmas story are our forerunners. They didn't have a Bible. They had no established religion, religious support for their journey. But look at the modern pictures today of the manger scene. Guess who's there? Guess who's there? Some shepherd guys, uh, graveyard shift dudes who kind of smell like sheep. But around them are these three kings. Maybe more. We don't know. It's three. We call them three kings. We three kings of Orient are the magi in the, sur in the, the story of the manger. These folks on the camels in that story, they're my forerunners. They're your forerunners if you're a spiritual refugee. They're your forerunners because they come 
crashing the party of religion to say, look, we don't know one Bible verse from another. All we know is there's a glorious sign in the sky. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that here on Sunday Night Sanctuary, I, I don't have a church budget to defend. I don't have a, a, a set of doctrines that I am defensive of so that I can't tell you what is really beating in my heart. Because what's really beating in my heart is that if it's not good news, it's not God's news. And if it's not God's news, it's subject to change. Good news has nothing to do with telling people we're here to rescue you from hell. That's not good news. That's bait and switch. Let's just tell people good news. Jesus descended into hell, preached the gospel, led captivity captive out of the gates of hell, and, and, and now we are the bearers of a God who has been reconciled to all the world. The sins of the world, the sin of the world has been taken away. The advent commands us a contemplative pause to think of the great light that is ours. I am one voice that wants to tell you about the great light that is ours. We have, we have the best news of all, uh, of all the, the, the fairy tales you may have imagined. We are now in a story of century-long anticipation. Advent commands us think. Take it down deep inside. Something, something commandingly powerful has happened to the world in Christ. We're not waiting for a second advent to change it all. He came the first time, changed it all, and said, now, go tell the whole world. Everything's changed now. Everything has changed. I, um, I, 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 I told you earlier that I used to have this struggle in me when I would believe the best of, of what I read in the scripture. I used to struggle because I was so uh, taught, deeply in, entrenched in thinking that somehow the other shoe was always going to drop, that, that God was really angry with the world and that, that somehow now we had better repent, turn away from all of our bad ways so that God can can barely manage to forgive us. That, I, it, that's, a, that's a very loose summary of my thoughts. But now I've come to believe in a grander vista because of his coming. He came, he shined a light, a great light has shined before us. And now we get to arise and shine for our light has come. No need to flee from this God because this God is good. This God is not a capricious, angry bastard, as I read to you earlier. This God is a good God. And any God that you've been told was less than good, less than happy, less than full of joy and love, is a, is a false God created by a religious organization to sustain doctrines and to sustain a, a leverage, a, a manipulation on the hearts and lives of people. See, you can always manipulate people by guilt and shame, but it's a whole other thing to do the heavy lifting of real love for wherever people are and whatever lifestyle they live. Just love them right where they are rather than manipulate them through guilt and shame. So that's why the first advent should mean all the world to us. My time is up. Thank you for tuning in. I love you all. And I know that I know that so many of you out there listening, you're spiritual refugees. You fled the 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 harsh, capricious, punishing God that's been taught in so many places, and you're embracing the God of Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. Uh, Brian Zahn says, We didn't know it before, but now we know. God is just like Jesus. That is exactly who God is. When people bring up examples of the Old Testament, well, when, when God did this and God did that and he killed those people and he killed them. Well, see, that was just the Old Testament view of who God was. So when Jesus came, he said, you have heard of old, but now I'm telling you something new. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, the Old Testament is the record of the evolution of a revelation of God that was growing as people 
could grasp and see uh, the God that they, they were loving and they had a belief in. But now we have Jesus. We have, the, we have the word, not in a book alone that I treasure and I carry, but we have the word in human flesh who demonstrate the goodness, the beauty, the significance, and the power of a loving God. <sighs> so I'm going to bring this plane in for a landing. <laughs> Thanks for joining here today. I'm so glad Facebook Live uh, cooperated with me today. Uh, it's been a while. We've been doing this recorded on our uh, YouTube channel. I'll, I'll put the link up for that so you can see where we've been before. Uh, I'm also going to put up links, and Ginger, I think, is watching. She'll put up our links for uh, my my website uh, for our uh, our oh for supporting our ministry. We believe we're in a we're in a mission to America. We're we're here to tell America God's in a good mood. God is not here to slay you. God is not here to make you into a Republican. God is here to turn you in to a kingdom of God, woman or man, a hero, a champion above all political postures, who can rise above all dark political shenanigans and become a real kingdom. Uh, seeker and warrior. So uh, so Ginger will put up links to uh, our PayPal, how you can support us as we go forward. We're excited about what we're doing. As I said earlier, uh, we're here at, I'm here right now at Forest Hills Retreat Center, which is a, a ministry of spiritual program retreat. I'll put up their, their uh, website in the comments later too. I'm the spiritual care director for this, this uh, uh, adventurous uh, exploit for the kingdom of God and for the recovery of hearts and lives all around us and hopefully around the world. Also, we'll let you know how to contact us. I have a radio broadcast called the No BS Bishop. Uh, all I'm alive to love. All lesser values are potential BS. I'm here to pronounce and proclaim and lift the flag of love that there is no banner above me greater than the banner of love. So uh, we'll have all that in the comments. But before we finish, I promised we would come to the table of the Lord, to the bread and to the cup. This is how Jesus says, I want you to remember me. Don't remember some image of God that looks more like a grumpy Moses or a, a, a finicky prophet. I want you to remember me, Jesus said. Remember what I said, what I did, how I behaved and how I performed because when you saw me, you saw the Father. And you know, when you see God that way, you recognize God was serving us a meal. God wasn't slaying us. God wasn't looking to punish us. God was looking to absorb all the punishment of humankind into his very own body so that he could kill it, send it to hell, to the grave, bury it, and be raised again to new life. I am here to proclaim the body of Christ to remember that we are made whole by his healing touch of body, of mind, and soul from the top of my head to my soul to the tips of my toes. I am healed. Thank you, Jesus, for this bread. And this, <coughs> excuse me, this is the cup of his blood. The blood that was spilled in a far grander, more transcendent way than the blood that was on the doorposts of the, child, the homes of the children of Israel when the death angel passed over their homes. This blood now is the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the singular sin. The, the whole concept, the whole precept, the whole principle of sin has been taken away by the blood of the Lamb. It is sin by sin. I, I understand that. So we confess our sins as we are aware of them. But we confess them in the basis and the knowledge that the sin, the foundation, the principle of sin has been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. He took the punishment of humankind, the, the punishment of sin, the punishment of death, upon himself, absorbed it into his body. He held it into him and he carried it into the bowels of the earth and he buried it. So when we, we drink this cup, we remember, we remember 
that we're no longer bound to the principle of sin. We're bound to the principle of righteousness and, and goodness and joy and hope and a freedom to know that too much of a good thing is wonderful. Remember the beauty of Jesus when you drink this cup. Thank you, Jesus. I am grateful for any of you who joined here tonight. If you came here tonight, just comment in the in the comments below. Read the comments. I, I believe I see Ginger's putting up our con connection information, my my email address, which I'd love for, for you to contact me by email. Uh, I'm here every Sunday night, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, to share with you. I'm going to try to do this live again. We've just had a, a spotty cell signal even to, to try to, to get this word out. God is in a good mood, and it's not just a measured good mood. It's not just a, a good mood based on some, some doctrinal point of view, or even he's in a good mood because you chose the right political party. That's nonsense. That's ridiculous. It's ab absurd. <laughs> he, he's in a good mood because he has chosen his own son, Jesus. He's chosen his own son, Jesus, to be your, your king. Ain't no king like Jesus, nor will we ever, ever need another king. We have one king, and his name is Jesus. All lesser kings will just have to bow and serve him, and that's where I'll live my life. So there I go. I'm going to start all over again if I don't quit. I'm so grateful you came here. Uh, I want you to... Feel free to share this Facebook Live. We'll repost it. I think I'm going to try to get it into our YouTube channel. Not quite sure how to do that. I'm learning. I'm an old dog. I learn new tricks, but I am grateful you came. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, go out and do something beautiful. You know why? Because ugly, ugh, ugly, oh, baby, ugly has been done to death death. Let's go out there and be beautiful people. Let's spread love like there's no tomorrow, but because there is a tomorrow, but let's spread love while we have this breath. And let's tell the world about the advent, the advent that leads to the, the culmination of Christmas. I love you all. Blessed advent, all you all, and may you find the peace of God that passes all understanding.